um, as, a, as today is the International Day of Women, I, I am I'm very excited to be able to tell you my story of uh, how I started in optics and um, and how my my career has gone so far. So uh, I'll start off with saying where, where I grew up. And so um, I grew up uh, right here in, in New York State um, and I grew up on a, a dairy farm. And uh, so it was it was a very, very much living in, in the country for, for, for most of my childhood in the town of Williamson, New York. We had a population of uh, about 6,500. And uh, on the United States, that little red dot there is, um, is, is where Williamson is located. It's actually about a half hour east of, of Rochester, where the University of Rochester, the Institute of Optics is. And we were right on Lake Ontario. Uh, so it was it was a, a very nice nice place to live, and one of the things that I uh, really enjoyed, and actually now that I live closer to the city, I, I miss, is that when uh, I was young, I used to to look up into the skies, and it was it was beautiful because they didn't we didn't have any of the light pollution that uh, that you, you you get when you when you move into cities and more populated areas, and it was it was always very very fascinating to me. I never was a, a an astronomer uh, by by desire, um, but the the idea of of being able to to know more about what's what's in our worlds and 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 worlds beyond us is is um, has always been very exciting to me. And uh, so when I was in, in school, I, I mentioned it was a small school, and which allowed me for allowed to have a a, a lot of different opportunities because um, as you get to larger uh, schools, at least in, in our area here, um, you you don't, you have to specialize. And I, I didn't necessarily have to specialize. I I really, I enjoyed math and science. My grandfather uh, also really uh, encouraged me to to do so. Uh, I remember when I was very young, he, he, he and I built a flashlight using duct tape and styrofoam to put the to make the casing together and, and with, even with a switch so I could learn how, how uh, electricity worked. Uh, but as I as I was in high school, my, my desire to learn more about math and science, uh, I, I enjoyed having an answer for a lot of things and understanding why. Um, and so I graduated uh, from Williamson Senior High School and it's, it's hard to see in this picture here because it's a uh, um, the, it's a, a photograph from uh, several years ago, uh, but this was my entire graduating class. So I graduated in 1998 with 98 students. So I said it, again, it was it was pretty pretty small. Um, I did graduate as a valedictorian. That's that's me there, um, uh, speaking to my class. And after that, I I needed to figure out what was next. And um, I'm a very goal driven person. I like to to have you know very very you know, very clear goals in my life. And and so when I was getting close to graduating, I needed to figure out, well, what's next? And I knew I wanted to go to college, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. So the first thing was choosing the right university. And so I looked at dozens of different colleges and my guidance counselor uh, gave me uh, two pieces of advice that um, I'm very, very grateful for her for, for doing. The, the first, uh, was when choosing what you're you're going to do for the rest of your life, uh, and, and what you want to study, choose something that you enjoy doing, and that that you can get a job with after after college. And so that was that was a very good piece of advice. And uh, and then the second uh, piece of advice was is when you're you're looking at colleges and universities, there are are there's there's thousands and thousands of different places you could potentially go, and and narrowing it down to just the right one is, is hard. And, and so she, she said, go visit, go visit lots of colleges, go visit them. And when you're on campus, you'll know. And so uh, I went to a, a lot of them and actually I mentioned here specifically, I, I only applied to two. The first one at Carthage College, I applied to because I um, was fortunate enough, I, I actually had received a full scholarship where I would not have to have, I would not have to pay anything to attend. And the second one was the University of Rochester. And um, <laughs> funny enough, uh, when I was at, at on the University of Rochester campus, I uh, turned to my parents and I said, this is where I'm going. This is where I feel I fit in. 
Um, this is this is the uh, a view from our uh, our quad uh, on the University of Rochester campus. Uh, Meliora is our our, our theme, uh, our our motto. I'm sorry, I mean, and it, it means ever better. And this really was it was it felt like home. And so this is where I um, I, I I decided to go. And so as I'm I'm there, I, you know, I said, all right, I'm all excited. I'm I'm a new a new first year freshman. You know what what I want what do I want to do? And so I had to decide. Well, what should I major in? I knew I liked physics and I liked engineering and I liked math. So I I being an you know an, an overzealous freshman uh, come in and say, well, I'm going to double major in physics and engineering. And I remember the <laughs> orientation counselor looking at me like I was a crazy person, and saying, you know. Maybe maybe you you might want to pick one or the other, and you can you can maybe minor, but you know double major is is pretty aggressive, especially for those those two majors. And I was ever so happy that I happened to get someone who was very familiar about optics, and they said, well, you know, what about optics? It combines a lot of the principles of physics and engineering. And so what what about optics? And so I said, okay. So I went over to the um, the optics. Uh, uh, orientation, and I said, okay, well, you know, your freshman year, you have a little flexibility about uh, about your your first year classes and taking some intro classes. So I took Optics 100, and I have to say, I was hooked. One of the things that I remember being very excited about is in that first class, they went through a lot of the principles that you see in, in everyday life, where you see like, well, why is the sky blue? And going through Riley scattering and explaining that, or like the times you see a, a double rainbow and, and talking about refraction. And these were things that, that were like, wow, these are all these things I've seen uh, throughout my life. And, and now I, I, I understand why. So this that was the start, and and, and you know the, the rest is history of, of keeping it going with the major, but this was was something that was really exciting. I have a video that hopefully we'll be able to sh to share about um, about the Institute of Optics, um, and hopefully it will play. <laughs> uh, so we'll see how this goes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Audio is not. In the video, audio is not clear.
the human um, and so that is the um um and so that's where I was and I, I so I was a student and I was taking classes and actually my first job on on campus uh, was I was I was working in a, in a department helping to file and papers. So essentially, I spent a lot of time alphabetizing, and I realized that that, that really wasn't what I, I I wanted to do. I wanted to do something with with all of the the cool engineering and and math and science I was learning. So I wanted an internship, and so I went to go see my my advisor, uh, Professor Tom Brown. And um, he was um, he, he was great. He's like, okay, well, I you know I know of a couple of professors that are looking for for interns. Let me let me help you out. And so, um, I, he, by the time I got back to my dorm room, I already had an email um, for, from Professor Steve Jacobs um, at the Laboratory for Laser Energetics saying, "Come on over, let's have a chat." And so um, that was um, where, where I ended up. Is is so I um, worked as an intern for for Steve Jacobs for. Um, several years, starting at the end of my sophomore year, my second year as an undergraduate, and I was was so excited to be able to work in a place where um, they had a laser the size of a football field. And so for for me, this was like, oh my goodness, this was this is this is awesome. Um, so this here is the the Laboratory for Laser Energetics. And any of you who are, who are not familiar, that the um, on the right hand side, this is um, the original Omega. And when I first started at um, at at the uh, the laser lab, um, this was all that was there, and so this was the, the sixty beams going into um, the target. And they um, soon um, after that started construction on EP, which is the extended performance over here, which um, also um, allowed for for short pulses as well. And so um, this was uh, this was this is very exciting, and but. I was actually not directly involved in of, of going inside the laser bay, um, but I did get to work on a lot of really cool projects. And um, one of the things I, I was able to do, which was as an undergraduate, was very exciting, is I got to um, to present some of my work. Um, the third year of my undergraduate degree, there was a there was a poster session in Rochester, New York. Um, and I was able to, to to put a poster together, go and present my work, and this was this was really quite neat. It, my first work was actually on um, optical polishing pitch, uh, and um, at the time there was um, there had been a change in where um, it had, was being manufactured, and a lot of the opticians were having trouble getting consistency in the pitch, and so I, d I developed some quantitative tests in order to be able to test it. Um, this was. This Manufacturing and testing, and uh, Dr. Phil Stahl was my uh, was the the uh, chair, and um, and still today, uh, I, I remember that that is A, 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 um, a higher degree. Um, a little aside on this, in case anyone is is not familiar with this, this is an optical fabrication technique to help to polish lenses. 
And this uses um, uh, a, a fluid that consists of carbonyl iron, which is referred to as CI sometimes, water and stabilizers, because if you mix iron and water together, it will uh, rust essentially, it'll oxidize, and then non-magnetic polishing abrasives. And when you uh, combine these all together, um, it has the consistency of honey. But when you apply a magnetic field, uh, the, the fluid stiffens four orders of magnitude to that of a consistency of clay. And when it's uh, in that, that consistency, uh, when you turn the magnetic field on, the carbonyl iron particles align in chains, and what's left on top are, is a thin film of the non-magnetic polishing abrasives and uh, water. And when the, um, the lens is placed into this uh, rotating uh, ribbon, uh, material is sheared off, in, and the majority of it's in the, the shear direction. And so this is this is a polishing uh, process. Here's a, just a, an animation of of the MRF process, showing before the magnetic field is applied, after the magnetic field is applied, and you can see the shear motion. And so one of the things that I I looked at with my thesis is where exactly do these nano diamonds go in the um, in in the fluid. And so I, my hypothesis was that, the, that they did get pulled down towards the, the wheel and that they were at the, the very top. And uh, so one of the experiments that I, I did to help prove this is that I took very small additions of nanodiamonds and I put them into um, a, a, a liter of fluid and watched the effect of the surface. And so this plot here, shows peak removal rate, this is the amount of material removed for a given amount of time, is a function of nanodiamond concentration. And for, um, for illustration, this is to scale, obviously, most of the carbonyl iron particles are about three microns in diameter, and you could see the, the relative size of the nanodiamond to the carbonyl iron, so they're significantly less. And so you see, starting off here, you can you could get material removal with MRF with no um, magnetic, uh, a non-magnetic polishing abrasive, so just the carbonyl iron, water, and stabilizers. And then when you start adding them, so this very first one, this is 0 0.001 volume percent, um, you're able to see an increase in material removal rate. And this is a concentration of just eight nanodiamond particles, so eight of these to every one of these, which is um, obviously pretty small. Um, and so you, you wouldn't necessarily see that type of effect. And my hypothesis was unless it went towards the top of the surface. And the other thing that strengthened that was what was happening to the surface texture at, during uh, material. And so we started with a polished part that looked like this, which was pitch polished. And then with the abrasive free, this is with just the, uh, the carbonyl iron particles, water and stabilizers, you saw this pitting. And this, this particular glass is LHG8. This is a phosphate laser glass used for the Omega laser. And it was um, the reason it was chosen is because it was extremely sensitive to changes in, um, in MR fluid. And then this one addition right here had um, a, a significantly different surface texture showing to us that obviously the diamonds were, were going where we thought they were at that, that top level. And this left uh, the, the, our, uh, one of, our, one of the, the main uh, portions of it is that we were seeing a micro gouging mechanism where there was pitting caused by the, the carbonyl iron particles rolling and sticking and, and actually gouging out a modified layer of glass. But this thin film of nano diamonds would aid in cutting and efficiently removing a softened layer of the glass, which we referred to as the microlateral fracture mechanism, which was first introduced by uh, John Lombrocklis and Eric Shorey, um, uh, also both from the University of Rochester. And so that the my entire thesis was on surface interactions between nanodiamonds and glass and magnetorheological finishing, or MRF. And so that part of this um, developed uh, a model of, of a quantitative model for for, um, in, for what is is going on in the the removal rate process that included mechanics, information about the polishing particle properties, both the nanodiamonds and the uh, carbonyl iron particles, 
as well as glass and, and MR fluid chemistry, that it wasn't just a mechanical process. So this was, it, it was very, and I, I still in my, today, I have a very soft spot for, for MRF because it is, um, it was, it, it was obviously one of, uh, spent a lot of time working with it, but then I needed to, to decide, well, what do I want to do next? And so I was at another crossroads at the end of graduate school. Uh, I, I didn't know, I, I, I loved the, the faster pace, as I mentioned before, of the, the, and the idea of going into industry. Um, and, but I still, I, I loved teaching too. And so this, I needed to, to figure out what to do. And also at the same time, so in my final year of, of graduate school, uh, I met my, my future husband and my, my husband today, and, um, we got married and he actually proposed to me, um, at, uh, uh, right before, like right before I defended. So that the month that I defended, so, uh, my thesis. And um, so we we got married the following year, and so it was it was also needed to be a, a joint decision of where, where to go. And uh, my husband was was absolutely fantastic. He was fiance at the time, very supportive, and he wanted to go to um, graduate school as well. And so I I looked at a bunch of different places to to go um, into into industry, and um, in parallel, he he actually had been looking at schools and applying. Said, wherever you decide to go, you know, follow, follow your your heart with this one. Let's you know find the right spot for you to work. And, and I'll um, I, I, there's great schools in, in every in every city. Uh, so my my transitions uh, right into Optimax, where I still am today, and it has been a very good fit for me. Um, so Optimax at Optimax we we uh, we make high precision optics, and so we utilize the MRF process. But we utilize a lot of different processes, and so this photo here is from from several years ago, uh, and um, you'll see that all of us are wearing tie dye. Um, this is something that has um, been referred to as our our um, uh, our, our our corporate uh, uniform per se, and um, this was it. It is part of it is because we we really embrace the idea of fun, and so and that it is. Um, we, we work hard, but then we also, and we play hard. And this is something that is, um, is very important to, to um, the overall co culture of, of Optimax. Um, and so uh, we are, so we still continue to be America's largest precision optics manufacturing company. We're located um, in Ontario, New York, uh, which is actually the town right next to where I grew up in Williamson. Uh, we were, um, they were founded in 1991. So this year we're actually going to be celebrating our 30th anniversary. We um, just expanded into a 120,000 square foot facility. And we um, actually, we have over 350. We, right now we're at 380 employees. And um, I so 9,001 certified. And some of the things that we do at Optimax, we, we, may, we may make, Custom optics, and what we we see is we provide custom engineering solutions uh, to to our, our customers' needs. So we work with um, um, everything brittle, glass, ceramics, crystals, fusilica, low expansion glass, ceramics, and then also some select three D printed materials. And our shapes, if you can define it, we can we can manufacture it uh, for the most part. Um, a spheres, freeform cylinders, domes, spheres, windows, and prisms. And our size ranges from anything from three to 500 millimeters. And we work with a, a multitude of different commercial optics. And this, this is a, a, just a small subset we, of some of our market spaces we work in. And what was exciting for me is that we're optics manufacturing and what they had already had in place at optics before I got there is they had something called lean manufacturing, where it is um, a, a cellular approach, um, similar to one that's been used in the, um, uh, the automotive industry for manufacturing, of instead of having each individual specialized in one particular area, the each, uh, the each um, in optic all the way from the blank through generation, um, um, grinding, polishing, and, and, and final inspection. And so in here, and one of the nice things between for modern optic manufacturing is it combines into a hybrid of both commercial deterministics with things like MRF and traditional and custom grinding and polishing methods into 
um, essentially, if you um, have a, a lot of tools in your toolbox, you can utilize them to make the best optic possible. I came in um, initially as, as a uh, research scientist and then um, became the R&D manager um, a couple of years after that. And some of the, the areas that we focus on are freeform optics manufacturing, novel metrology systems, um, engineered precision surfaces. This is talking about subsurface damage, damage-free surfaces. We work with new materials. So anytime someone has something new that they that they are, are, are novel, they want to try, this is something we try out processes for, high-performance optical coatings, and innovative optical manufacturing methods, such as a um, uh, additive manufacturing and or, or uh, laser processing. And our um, strategy for R&D and, and um, SBIRs or Small Business Innovative Research Grants at Optimax, overall our business model, as I mentioned, is a service industry. We provide um, high precision optics. And so we don't have a product that we're putting out into the marketplace. And so, um, and one of the things that we, we have found very successful is that we're early adopters of novel technology. And so if someone else has already developed it, we are very happy to, to try to, to purchase it and incorporate it into our process. Um, and where we focus our R&D and engineering efforts is to fill in the gaps in technology. And this uh, allows us to focus on the processes that enable higher precision, more complex geometries, and the ability to work with novel materials. And our, as I mentioned before, our, our projects span all the way from, from generation, so creating the, the initial shape, polishing, measurement, deterministic figure correction, smoothing, and then thin film coating. So as I, I uh, was, was working on a lot of these cool projects with some great teams, um, I had a desire to, to really connect the innovation strategy with corporate strategy. And so I made the decision to go back to school. And so um, this was something that um, got long and hard about. I mean, as many of you know that are, they're in grad school, it's a lot of work. And so once you're working full time, and I was married at the time, I did not have any children. And I decided, you know, now is before before my husband and I had kids, we, we talked about it, like, let's do this, let's do this now. And it will fit into a lot of what I had been working on at Optimax. So I went back and I did the uh, executive program at the Simon School of Business at the University of Rochester. Um, I did it in, oh, about, it was about nine years ago now. And um, and it completed my, uh, my uh, master's in business, my MBA. And so I continue to work at Optimax and I've played several different roles at, at Optimax. Um, I have, uh, I've worked in, in research, as I've mentioned before, and, um, and that has stayed consistent all the way through. I've been a part of the, the r &E department throughout um, my entire tenure at Optimax. And in addition to that, I have also um, um, worked in other and managed in other areas, such as our quality department, our, uh, some of our, our, our manufacturing um, uh, processes, such as our prototype manufacturing, and then our engineering department as well. And one of the, the things that, this, that a lot of these positions helped me to do is get the experience to move into my current role, which is Director of Technology and Strategy. So this incorporates the, oh, exactly what I, why I went back to get my MBA is to incorporate our innovation strategy and our corporate strategy. And what we have developed is something that we call the, the continuous strategic planning process. And we, I think of this as like a, looking at a, at a horizon. And so where you have at the top your values and your mission, anything above the horizon, these don't change. These are things that are that are, make you who you are as an organization. And then underneath the horizon, these are these are, are things that, that are achieved over time. Like your goals can be achieved and it's important as you achieve goals that you make a new one. And this is true regardless if you're in, in, if, as an indiv individual, or as a corporation, or even as a team, uh, whatever it is, this, this is an important part. Of, and so what we've done to define some of these a little bit is first looking at our mission. Um, your mission is the enduring reason for the existence of an organization. It's such an ample purpose that can never be completed. So it's, it's why, you're, why you exist. Essentially, and for for Optimax, it's to enable customer success and employee prosperity. And then values; these are the basic behavioral guidelines, the belief system for, for an organization. 
And what at Op Optimax, we've defined this as the Optimax way. And actually, very recently, I actually wrote, we had a book created that, that really helps to define this, especially for onboarding new, new employees. And again, these are above the horizon. These don't change. This is who we are and how we, how we behave as an organization. And then as you go below the horizon, you look at your vision. This is an inspiring image of a desired outcome at a given moment in the future. And our, our vision at the current time is to be the leading optics provider building the highest performing teams and solutions. And we've had several different visions throughout the years. And this is something that, because you can achieve a vision. And when you achieve that vision, it's important to what's next. And so there's also then your strategy. This is how you get to your vision. These are the roadmaps that lead us to our vision. And again, this can be applicable to an organization or it can be applicable to an individual working towards what their, their, their vision is for themselves in the, future, in, the, in the future. Like if you if you use myself in, as an example, I had the, you know, I, I had the vision. I, I wanted to be able to connect innovation strategy and corporate strategy. And, and so and so in order to be able to do that, I, I, I knew I needed more tools in my toolbox and that's where I, I continued my education. So for a corporation and specific for Optimax, we use, we have a product roadmap, a technology roadmap and a competency roadmap. And I have another slide on that in just a minute to explain those a little bit more. And then your goals. These are descriptions of wanted results at different stages of the technology. These a lot of times are the milestones you have, whether in a project or on, uh, on things that you wanna do and for a, a corporation or true north goals. These are annual goals that we have that this is what we wanna do, whether it's on a monthly or annual or three year or five year basis. So these are some the milestones we wanna hit or mile markers. And then you have your operational plans. This is how we reach our goals. And these are projects, actions, and tasks, and continuous improvement um, uh, activities. And this, these are extremely important to, to the action. This is how things get done. And these are both your, your business unit, department, strategic operational plans, and then engineering projects. And all of these incorporate together into continuous strategic planning. And, and so a lot of people ask, well, well, how is this different than what most companies do? And so what, we, we are doing differently than, the, than the, the initial, like, okay, let's make the annual plan, work to it, try to get it done, do this every year. We are trying to build a strategic planning framework that allows for long-term planning. So where we wanna go, that, that horizon point, our vision, but a short-term flexibility because things change. Um, you're, you're, going to, you're, going to hit, you're going to hit obstacles that you may not be able to plan for and like such as like COVID-19, this is a perfect example of, of a hurdle that everyone faces with that um, no one planned for. And so this, and one of the things that this helps do is it separates strategic and tactical planning, combines them into a framework, but has them um, separate. And the other thing it does is a, for a overall strategic planning framework is it provides direction and motivation for everyone to be on the same page with and answering what and why but um, allowing those that are in each role to, to determine the best way to, to solve a problem and to get the how. And this is helping to increase employee engagement. So employees are informed that they can, so they can make eff effectively make decisions in their roles. Um, their surveys forms to increase the number of voices involved in the process and less management control over every decision. And so just a, as a, br a brief, a, another way to look at our framework it's a visualization between strategic and tactical, strategic looking at your what, what your market offerings are, and then your um, technology roadmap, your innovations, whether a product roadmap driven or disruptive, and then operational plans. This is a little bit more tactical. These are things that need to be, be um, decided and changed very continuously because situations are changing. And then uh, in a, in a third axis, which I am not really good at doing a PowerPoint. So if you can imagine a third axis, your competency roadmap. These are the resources we need in order to, to complete both the, the, the strategic and tactical um, uh, processes, capital expenditure space, people, and project development time. And so one way to, to that we've, we've looked at this is, is your, you have existing customers in the market and they request uh, products and services. And then your, um, the, your existing customer can also request incrementally improved products or services. 
And then you, you then bring in continuous improvement, new technology adoption, or new technology innovation. These enable this incrementally improved product or service. And then this is something that can possibly enable new customers in the existing market with your incrementally improved product service, something you couldn't do today that you can do tomorrow. And then in addition, these, these whether the new customers or existing customers can, can ask for or could request new products or services that are adjacent. And new technology adoption or new technology innovation can help enable these new products or services for a company which then could enable a new, uh, new market. So this is something that you're, you, you're not currently, uh, a market you're not currently serving. And then comes in disruptive technology, and which I'm, uh, a, a lot of you are, are probably researching right now is some of these, the, the next generation disruptive technologies that, that could enable the purchase of a new technology adoption, or it could enable a new technology innovation, or it can enable a new market. It can enable something like brand new that we, we're not able to see. And so being able to keep track of every single one of these things and all the possibilities that come in and all of, uh, in this very uh, complicated diagram, and it involves many different teams looking at different facets of this. And so as we start getting into a lot of these, like uh, whether it's, it's a business unit or whether it's a department or whether it's an individual or whether it's a team, a cross-functional team, there's a lot of things happening in an organization to keep track of all of these things. And so when you start, you know, looking at all the different connections within an organization, it begins to resemble the, the, the human body. And so, and one of the, the things that, that we have tried to do at Optimax is to sense and respond. So you're, at, at all times, your, your head is not, your, your brain is not telling your, your heart to be and your, or your, your lungs to breathe. You have to sense and respond and you have you not predict and control. And this is really important, not only in, in, um, in, in, in organisms, but also in corporations. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're giving all employees access to the tools and information they need to trust to make the right decisions. And so these are some of the things I'm, I'm, I'm helping to work with, with a great team at Optimax to, to work on. And, and I'm gonna circle back, remember the that I'm, Life, and um, I'm also now a, a mother. Um, so this is a, a photograph of my my little girl. She's now four years old. My husband uh, thinks I'm too highly recommend is balancing um, both work and in home. Your personal life is very important, whatever that and how that looks uh, to to everyone. And remembering that these are these are things that uh, that. You, you need to, to, to find that balance, whatever that balance looks like for, for each individual. And each individual is different and that's okay. And so one of the things that, that uh, going back to, 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 uh, to Optimax, we're providing value to our customers combining and R&D technology. New technology um, R and D in order to be able to make the whole process. Because again, we're making optics. We're not making one type of manufacturing machine. Look at the process. We're working in her counter. and laser processing. Additively uh, manufactured lightweight mirrors, freeform monolithic telescopes, freeform uh, fiducials um, for total air, um, vibe finishing to reduce mid spatial frequency error, spatial asymmetric optics, and high energy laser coatings and cleaning materials. And some of the things that we have uh, have been enabled through R&D developed technologies to the marketplace, freeform optics um, from commercial to precision freeforms optically precise conformal windows, um, surfaces with limited mid-spatial frequency errors, uh, grain decoration free, um, polycrystalline ceramics and freeforms, high energy laser optical coatings and cleaning protocols, high speed polishing of sapphire, um, spherical concentric um, hard ceramic domes and additively manufactured lightweight mirror substrates. And I mentioned in my title, the uh, Jim Mars Rover. One of the things that Optimax 
that is, is really cool is how many um, how many um, uh, different missions we have helped to support making the making some of the objects. And so this is some of them. I've been looking at the the entire galaxy from Mercury, Mercury Messenger all the way to Pluto New Horizons. And most recently, the Mars 20 rover, which was really uh, a neat project to be a part of, and and knowing that when those images are coming through lens um, at optics, so it's an organization to be a part. Of. So that was, it's it's some of the cool kind of work. I am important feature of SBI and OSA um, uh, several different things different events that are both of the SBA there's also the OSA say optical also just like our, our, our local chapter is, is an OSA chapter um, and one of the things that came out of that is the optic suitcase and this has been uh, really important for educational outreach. Um, another uh, thing that I, I also do is I'm also an adjunct um, at the University of Rochester, where I teach uh, both undergraduate and, and graduate classes on, on optical fabrication and testing. And so it, the, the question for, for a lot of us is, why did, did you become an engineer? And were you fortunate enough to know that you had the knack at, the, at a young age? And so this is a, a Dilbert cartoon. Um, hopefully you can hear. Uh, so it's just a, me, did a person or experience that can inspire you? But what is, is really something that is, is really important to remember, and, and a lot of you found the path through to, however it was, to to, to uh, optics and photonics. However, not everyone has found that path. And in uh, STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, our global economy depends on increasing the number of qualified STEM graduates. And so this is um, a recent um, um, projection of, of the growth STEM. Here is, here is um, STEM employment and non-STEM uh, and how much growth is um, anticipated. Um, and you can see that there's definitely a lot of jobs and, and, and opportunities out there for, for STEM graduates. And these companies are competing for limited numbers. And one of the things that is, is really important, and it's important to all of us, not only to, um, it, to, to, and to just to, to educators, but everyone to help promote STEM education to the, the next generation in order to, to help create the ability to have a workforce that our global commerce. And so this is a, um, a little bit older, but I like the image. And so this is a, a, a leaking STEM pipeline where it goes through uh, 4 million ninth graders. And a lot of them, you know, then, you know, decide to go to, to other things, which other, other, you know, majors are fine. However, we need more STEM graduates and then go to, to high school. And again, that, that, that path, like, well, what do I want to do next? What do I want to major in? Where do I want to go? So college plans and uh, whether college or college ready and then immediately less majoring in STEM and then uh, STEM graduates. So this is so this is important all the way from those who decide 
to uh, high wage footing um, as practicing um, engineers out of, out of bachelors, and then also your technicians that are extremely important to the to the entire process. All of these require STEM in the in the process. In the process. And so this, is, this is something that is really important, and why I um, strongly encourage everyone to get involved in outreach activities. And so, what's next? Uh, and for, for everyone, and for, you know, I, I the, the process. I find the process of you know continuing to sense and respond and engage as many people as possible in the process. This is true for an organization. This is true when you're involved in a um, in in different. Um, such as as such as SBIE, and so I strongly encourage everyone to get involved as much as possible because in order to make the global best decisions possible and get us getting more people involved, more people raising their hand, more people, um, and you know giving their thoughts and opinions, and that's what makes um, you know societies and organizations fantastic. And I'll as I. One of the, the quotes that I um, that's a lot to me is because your your goals are so important. And you're not always going to exactly hit your goal. And so, which is it is also just it's pretty awesome. And so, with that, I will will close and say thank you uh, very much for inviting me. And I'm happy to listen and hopefully hear the whole thing and be able to um, and uh, again i i'm you know you feel free if you see hopefully everyone will be able to see everyone at conferences one day again um but if you see me either virtually or send me an email i'm also very happy to to answer any other questions and so that thank you ma'am i will see. okay i'm not sure how to un uh, thank, thank on the screen there we go Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, Nelson, and it's a uh, on, on, uh, MRF fluidics and uh, many uh, more uh, areas. Thank you very much. Now I would request to Palak kindly take the question answer session. Palak. Good evening, everyone. As there are no questions in the chat, so if anyone has uh, any questions, they can just unmute themselves one by one and ask. Hello, I think no questions from the audience. I have one question, ma'am. Okay, yes, go. go These one questions from uh, keep work life balance. My mantra to keep work life balance. Um, that, um, if I have something that I a mantra that I that I say, um, but one of the things that uh, keeps me balanced, probably more so than than anything else, is um, is my my daughter, and um, and it is looking at her and making sure that that she has experiences and things to, to show her that uh, it's okay to have a career and to 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 do things that to. A, you know, a person to her mother, but then also it's important for me to, to be there for her life experience as well, making her uh, back and forth. And so, uh, uh, keeping months in mind is is 
probably one of the, the best uh, I more of a feeling than it is when it is something that I, I, I say to myself. Uh, and I can, I see the, the chats over here and I apologize also, it looks like public audio is not uh, visible. About audio. Uh, and one of the questions are, what are the problems during your... So, uh, there's, 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 I don't think a uh, huge, like, insurmountable one instance, but there's a lot of times where you're facing... When technically things don't work or you don't have uh, funding, I have the arm, arm of, uh, that was very scary, especially for those that well, the go if, um, if, if a company or, um, is something that the the strategy we're looking forward to the future and so making sure to in order your future consists of research of of now and so um and then uh, the other thing actually probably one of the bigger things with my journey was actually um with with uh when i when my husband and i decided to start a, a family we we did struggle and um and that was something that that was was very important to me to to make sure that i uh that i did have a family and did have my daughter uh, you being interested, what is the leadership qualities that are most important to industries? Um, one of the things that um, is, <laughs> there's a couple, there's multiple things that, that make leadership qualities important and is um, uh, that to stay connected at, at some level, not only internally, but externally. Um, it is in leadership, one of the, the roles is to make sure that um, that that you that ever, that you understand what's happening in the external environment and then internal. There's there's a tool that is is known as a SWOT analysis: strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And your strengths and, and weaknesses those are internally focused. Opportunities and threats those are externally focused. So what's happening in the environment around you? And as a leader, um, it is important to to keep in mind. Um, all of those things and so that is something that is um probably one of uh, as a really good quality to, to know is to keep an open mind but then also stay connected both internally and so important to to your organization to all the employees in your organization but then also externally what, what obstacles and or opportunities do might you uh, be able to, might you be facing Hello. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You I can, can hear you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Happy Women's Day. I want to put a question that uh, you have experienced the polishing process with MRF. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how do you compare uh, the conventional polishing process with cerium oxide and MRF? Like in terms of uh, you have experienced a uh, lot of difficult work piece as far as uh, complexity, shape complexities is concerned, mm -hmm. and as far as uh, surface finish is concerned. So, how do you compare both these processes in terms of handling complex shop mm -hmm. and at the same time getting a smoother surface? Okay, so so with it first the, the complex geometries, um, in order to use pitch polishing with with cerium oxide um, uh, for complex geometries, it, it is very difficult um, because it is not uh, for for pitch polishing, it's not computer controlled. Whereas once you move to MRF, um, it is um, deterministic, and so you can you can put in the, the prescribed shape and the software algorithms that they have developed uh, make for very high precision surface form. And then you talked about surface finish as well. And so whereas MRF does produce a, a very nice surface finish, 
one or polishing technology that you, you run the risk of is something called mid spatial frequency errors. Because when you have a small tool polisher, um, it, it has, it will leave behind a signature of the tool. And so, even though within within the polishing area, the MRF leaves and, and many of the, the other sub aperture polishing technologies, they, they do an excellent job of hitting the surface form and then also that surface total finish. And, um, and pitch polishing also leaves a very good surface texture as well. Then there's mid spatial frequency errors, the, essentially the, 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 the tool path errors. And this, this is not insurmountable. A lot of the times has, um, needs to have some type of finishing after, afterwards in order to smooth those, those out, depending on system requirements. It's not the surface is, looks just for the, uh, the, spot for the, the system, um, but uh, some of them, some systems can be uh, susceptible to those. And some, sometimes they can be worse than others. And so there's um, a balance between it. And so it is not, it depend, in some geometries, you cannot polish with pitch. Um, they're just too complex. You have to use some type of sub aperture polishing process. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would request to Priyanka to kindly thanks note over today's speaker, Dr. Jessica. Priyanka. Good evening, ma'am. I would like to thank you for taking us through our journey from high school to your career uh, job and also telling us, giving us insights about balancing your work life and uh, personal life. Uh, it's been really inspiring. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Um, and, and yes, please, um, I shall leave in the chat here. I'll put my... Uh, my email address. Um, also involved with the Now I would request to all kindly switch on your camera so that we can take a digital selfie with our today's speaker. Kindly put on your camera. Thank you. Please put on your cameras so that we can take a digital selfie with our today's speaker. I request you all. Think some. I think some network error is coming. <laughs> 